Hey there, Gothamites. Brian Ward here, welcoming you to another episode of the Arkham Sessions, brought to you by Comics Alliance. With me, as always, the psychologist that takes a look under the mask, Dr. Andrea Letamendi. Hello. Hello. Drea, you have got a really big deal article out right now over at uh, one of my favorite websites. Tell the folks. Well, you you sort of spoiled it. I was going to say uh, I was in Playboy this week, mm. but uh, you did mention article, and this is true. I wrote up an article actually about uh, someone we talk about quite frequently on our show, Bruce Wayne. <gasps> what? So with the, um, of course, the TV show Gotham, uh, airing this week for the first time and the pilot being out and everybody talking about little Bruce Wayne and what he experienced as a child mm -hmm. and how he will grow up to become Batman. I wrote a, basically an article exploring both the adaptive and maladaptive ways that he responds and, and reacts to, um, this trauma that he experienced, of course, his, um, the, the death of his parents, the murder of his parents. Mm -hmm. So in that article, I talk about, um, kind of the different ways in which we would approach, um, you know, child therapy and, um, our understanding of the, you know, the complexity really of developmental psychopathology, mm -hmm. what that really means. I mean, those are just fancy words that mean, the the development of wellness and yeah. the development of illness and how um how that relates to bruce wayne and you've also got a second article at one of my other favorite websites if not my favorite website comics alliance with the debut of gotham this is true so i really talk in depth about the pilot episode of gotham in uh in my comics alliance review and uh, do, do you have a lot of good things to say about Gotham? Did you enjoy Gotham? I do. You know, it's a little bit controversial. I feel like pe some people um, just out of some strange, I don't know, internal policy, they, they won't watch it. Mm -hmm. um, they think too much has changed. Um, they, they're they not interested in, in this particular story. So the purists. Maybe. Um, yeah. And I'm a little bit more open-minded. I'm certainly, you know, I'm very curious yeah. about little Bruce Wayne and Gotham city and how this all started. I think this is really an opportunity for us to explore the psychology of these characters with, with every new, I've said this before on other episodes, I'm sure. And, and you and I have talked about it. It's one of the reasons why I actually enjoyed man of steel. I can disconnect myself from the source material and any new writer that takes on the material gets their crack at an origin story. And, and we have to go, we can't go with the burden of what's been before. We have to go with what that writer is declaring is canon in this particular series. Right. So anyone who decided to make changes and then other people who don't like it, well, that's not really fair to the writer that, that mm -hmm. you're, you know, you've entrusted this story with. This is a new story. It doesn't mean that the comics aren't there anymore. It doesn't mean that canon has been completely changed. They're just trying to figure out a way to make Gotham City interesting, you know, however many years before Batman comes onto the scene. And, and you know, it's... It's something I'm okay with. Now, I, I've got other fundamental problems with so, the right. series. So, right, what did you think of the show? Um, I think the first half of it is a little heavy on the uh, on the name checking. I, I think there are too many people being called things that we know that they will eventually become. Okay, so like the penguin. The penguin, uh, the fact that Poison Ivy... Uh, we we see her as a child and her name is now Ivy instead of pa uh, Pamela Isley. And, and so uh, we've got them. Edward Nigma shows up. It, it, it's just gotten to a point where I would like to see Batman come onto the scene because Gotham got worse, not necessarily because all of these people were there from the very beginning. Right. So you're saying that they, uh, these villains um, migrated to Gotham at, at some point rather yeah. than they were born in Gotham developed, you know, that, that they were a part of Gotham city yeah. throughout Bruce Wayne's childhood, yeah. that there's something inherent about that particular piece. Yeah. I, at this point, I feel like, uh, we're basically just waiting for Bruce to grow up because we've now been introduced to a number of the villains and we know that there's already been talk about there being a, a Joker or maybe even several people who could potentially be the Joker. 
So now I don't really feel like Gotham. I, I don't. I don't get the sense that we're seeing Gotham's origins so much as we're just kind of seeing Gotham ten, twelve years before Batman gets there. Well, you, right, but I completely disagree in the sense that for me to fully understand um, an individual, I need to know some parts of their history. I need to know their traumatic events. I need to know their, um, you know, their backgrounds, their how they were raised, um, who parented them. You know, these important questions that help us understand their behavior now. So while it's, it sounds like what you're saying is, well, I kind of know what's going to happen, well, so I'm disinterested in, in the development of these characters. I already have... Well, no, I wouldn't be disinterested in the development of the characters if we didn't meet them in the pilot. You know, it, give us a season or two before you introduce us to all these other characters. There's no reason in the world why we need to see Selena Kyle, a.k.a. Catwoman, as a child, looking just like a mini Catwoman. Like she, it it implies that she never grew. She never became that character. She already was that character. Ivy already is obsessed with plants. Like it's just sort of. Well, but you have to start somewhere. So. Right. So start somewhere. Don't start at the end. The, the end, you know, now it's just, they're just growing up. You know, are I, you so okay? Maybe are you somewhat irritated or upset at the idea that three very prominent redheaded characters oh, are? Oh, now you got to bring that up. Sorry, but I noticed that three characters who are, um, I would say, known to be redheaded are either blonde or brunette in in this story. So that would be James Gordon, his wife Barbara Gordon, and of course... Well, she's not his wife yet. She's still Barbara Kane at this point. Okay. So his his partner, his romantic partner, uh, soon, well, future mother Mm -hmm. of Batgirl slash Barbara Gordon. Unless they change it. They could change it. And, uh, of course, uh, Little Ivy is... Mm -hmm. um, She's she's sort of got a brunette color... Mm -hmm. I don't. I didn't. I didn't notice. I, I mean, to me, she was probably on the more of the reddish hair side, but she was also grungy and you know she. <laughs> she was. Her, been she was actually dirt. dirty. <laughs> like that's just. I mean, I. I don't know. There. There's just. I. I think it's too much in the course of the first 44 minutes of the show. I think we could have developed it a little bit more. We could have. We could have met these characters along the way. I don't think there's any reason why uh, Bruce needs to know Selena because clearly they're going to go in that route. I don't think there's any reason to believe that Ivy is going to be developing into Poison Ivy from day one. I, I think I, I think we should we should meet her somewhere down the line, you know, and in, in, in a different way. Um, I don't know. It, it, you know, I'll give the show a shot. I saw the pilot. It was okay once it became a crime procedural. That's what I want to see. If if we got to see Lieutenant James Gordon in The Wire, mm-hmm. I would totally watch that show because we don't need supervillains. Mm-hmm. We're watching a guy trying to take down corruption of the city and of the police force. And that's enough for me because we know that Gotham gets bad. That's the other problem that I have with this show. Fundamentally, it can't end well. It's got to end basically with... Batman coming to town because Gordon wasn't able to do it on his own. The police department is corrupt. The city is corrupt. It's only got to get worse over the next 12, 15 years. And and we're going to watch that happen. The good guys can't win. Well, and and that speaks to the psychology of the audience that despite some of, some of your um, misgivings and reluctance, there is a large audience for this show. And I think part of that has to do with the, the fandom and, and the, you know, our love for the character of Bruce Wayne and, and of course, Batman. But I think there is this curiosity we have about just how bad it's going to get. And um, we'd like to observe and witness some of some of that sort of citywide maladaption. So for more psychology of Gotham, you can check out my article in Comics Alliance. It should be up today. Yeah. And then uh, everyone should definitely let us know what you think about the show in the comment section below. So let us know and uh, maybe we'll talk about it as the show progresses. It is coming back next week after all and so are we. So who knows what we might think. Well, one of us will be. Well, I'm sorry that you won't be here. (laughs) 
Um, so let's talk about this episode of the Arkham Sessions, shall we? Batman the Animated Series. It's the reason we're all here. It's our it's our opportunity to get reacquainted with Selena Kyle. Let's skin that cat. Yeah, let's no. <laughs> let let us indeed. This is the second time that we've seen her. Technically, the third because the first time we saw her was in a two parter. It was the Cat in the Claw parts one and two. But because that was one story, I counted as one. Um, and. What I like about this particular series is it begins acknowledging that episode and the fact that Selina Kyle actually helped save Gotham City from the Red Claw. We open up and we see that uh, Selina is on trial for the, her crimes. Now, this hasn't been a regular trial. She actually pled guilty to the crimes. Uh, and and the judge says something very interesting here, and let's see if you caught it, Drea. Selena Kyle, you have pled guilty to the charges brought against Catwoman. Uh, I'm sorry, what? Yeah, it's the exact same problem that we ran into last week. Suddenly, let's put it this way. If John Wayne Gacy were to... Uh, you know, go to trial for his crimes. I don't think the judge would ever be like, John Wayne Gacy, you are guilty of the crimes committed by Pogo the Clown. It's it's not a separate identity. It's just the disguise she was wearing. Right. I, I, well, two things. One is, well, now everyone knows who Selena Kyle is. Yeah. It's, it's no, it's, it's not a mystery anymore that Catwoman is Selena Kyle, Selena mm -hmm. Kyle is Catwoman. And and then the other thing here is that um, it's almost like the the acts, the behaviors that you know that she demonstrated as Catwoman are sort of separated yeah. as well. When you were Catwoman, mm -hmm. um, you know you did things that were illegal, so yeah. we need to put you to trial for that. Yeah. Um. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's taking a, it's responsibility bizarre. for a second person uh, persona, maybe uh, something along those lines. But the judge is a little lenient in the verdict. Since you did help save Gotham City from annihilation and the district attorney has recommended a plea bargain, I have decided to sentence you to five years probation. Yeah, so she's getting five years probation. Now, what's interesting is the, the DA is actually the one, uh, or assistant DA or whomever, is actually the one who suggested the plea bargain. So, like, so like the prosecuting attorneys weren't even going after hard jail time. They... They were like, eh, let's plea it down to five years probation. And and she's got some fans here. Yeah. She has like a little uh little fan group. Yeah, everybody uh, everybody gets really excited, but you know what? I'm not finished. No, oh. she's not. She wants Selena to know that if she ever even thinks about donning the Catwoman costume and i guess persona ever again she's basically going to get the book thrown at her well this obviously raises a number of questions throughout gotham city now that selena kyle is on the loose can this lady leopard really change her spot what do you think drea can can someone can someone make the change was that someone opening up like a beer <laughs> <laughs> I wonder. Clink. <laughs> no, no I, it was it was Bruce Wayne working out. Oh, okay. Yeah, getting okay. all hot and bothered for Selena Kyle coming out of the courtroom. Uh, so, what was the question? I'm very distracted right now. the The question was: Can this lady leopard really change her spots? Can she? Clink. Well, right. Yes, I, I think of course. When it comes to Selena Kyle, remember we talked about some of the reasoning behind her criminal behavior. Mm -hmm. And so I and, think and the reasoning was that she felt just she was actually protecting the wildlife. Right. And, you know, right. That. Much like Poison Ivy. Mm -hmm. She has this rationale um, behind some of her illegal behavior. Yeah. So I think, you know, again, the same thing that we we discussed regarding Poison Ivy. Can we kind of, you know, guide that behavior towards something that's more adaptive and, and pro-social, which it can be. I don't think so. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I'm just saying, you know, that Bruce may is saying enough, it right there. That may be enough to keep her from having to engage in illegal activity. And and it's sort of, she's, she's kind of the anti-hero in some moments as well, because mm-hmm. we know Gotham City is corrupt. We know that there is going to be some um, very, very um, questionable and, you know, ethically uh, problematic things going on. Um, throughout the city and that she may find, she may be compelled to be the person, um, you know, who else is going to rescue these animals? Who else is going to ensure that there's going to be safety and security for, for cats, uh, for wildlife. So I think that, I don't know that she necessarily needs to change. She's not legally allowed to become that person. So unlike Batman, who technically isn't legally allowed to do it either. Uh, Unlike Batman, who believes that he's the only one who can stand up for the citizens of Gotham against the superstitious, cowardly lot, you've got Selina Kyle, who believes that she needs to don this persona to stand up for the animals of Gotham. uh, And uh, she's not really allowed to. So do you think that Selina would be able to not don that costume uh, and and not become a cat burglar uh, in order to pay for her, you know, buying up land and, you know, as, as wildlife per- preserves and yeah. all that? I think there's a chance. But as they say, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. Mm. So I would say that unless there's something that changes, um, she will very likely be compelled to do it. Yeah. Well, you and Bruce may actually feel the same way about Selena. He's a little skeptical. I'm not totally convinced she's given up her criminal life. He's so judgy. He is a little judgy. Talk about that a little bit. Once again, we run into Bruce Wayne, or Bruce, the Bruce persona, uh, who, again, automatically jumps to the worst in people. Right. Well, in the last episode involving Catwoman, we talked about his black and white thinking or all or nothing thinking that Mm -hmm. someone is either bad or someone is good. So if they have this history of bad behavior of, um, you know, breaking rules and and dismissing laws and kind of doing their own thing, he may kind of, I don't know, categorize them as a villain or as someone who's going to be against him. Right. Right. So we can probably sit here and say with confidence that, you know, there's a more complex psychology behind Selena that she, there is a chance that she would change. There is a chance that she's not just inherently bad and, and will, will do bad things. Um, but I think that Bruce has this, you know, this, um, this kind of simplistic way of dealing with her or of, of um, conceptualizing her in that he, he believes that she's now that she has this history, that's how she's going to behave. He just, you know, he has this, unfortunately he doesn't believe that she can redeem herself. He doesn't really believe in her. He's kind of, again, there's a lot of judgment around that. Let's skin that cat. So, yeah, and, and there is, there's a little bit of conflict there because he's also maybe even in love with her. He, he's certainly enamored by her. He is infatuated with her, but uh, he's a little put off by the fact that as we remember from the Cat in the Claw part one, she is actually in love with Batman, not with Bruce Wayne. Um, these modern relationships can be so complicated. Yeah. So it's, it's one of those situations where is maybe his distrust in her simply that he can see that she only digs the dark brooding mysterious guy and that she's bound to want to put on the costume once again, or does does he think that that she just doesn't have the ability to to change? Well, we'll we'll have to see. She does try though. She goes home and she's she's very happy to be home. Um, unfortunately, something isn't there waiting for her. Where's my cat? Isis is missing. 
we all remember Isis, the the cat she had with her. And, uh, you know, probably her best friend and sidekick, the, the, the cat who actually helped her rob, you know, jewelry and, you know, things like that. She's a very talented cat. I'd be pretty pissed if she were missing. Yeah. Well, Isis is missing. She has no idea where she is. And uh, she decides to go looking for her. She does it the only way that really you can. You, you do it the same way that Dick Grayson went looking for Tony Zuko uh, back when he was a kid. You wander the streets of Gotham showing people a photo of the cat and uh, in a, in a uh, dialogue-less montage, there are people just shaking their heads no. <laughs> She goes looking and, and you know ends up finding two cats that are very angry with one another uh, down in an alleyway. And she decides to feed them because she's, she's their friend. And uh, they, they enjoy the, the food that she lays out for them. But all of that is interrupted when a truck comes down and it's, uh, it's got a very familiar name on the side, Daggett. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. We know, we know who owns this truck. It is none other than Roland Daggett, who we all remember from, uh, you know, he, he is the one behind Clayface. Mm-hmm. So a lot going on here. Two folks of, of his are there with Nets, and they're looking for animals for stray cats and and you know they're going to go and, and try to take these cats she ends up fighting them off and getting into a little trouble these these two uh they they aren't really having it uh but luckily batman is there maybe because he didn't trust her oh he followed her maybe he may have followed her but he he sort of saves her there in that moment and uh but not before Selena can, you know, plop a, uh, a, a trash can over the head of the, the woman who, by the way, redhead. That's one way to take out the trash. So Batman helps save the day. And uh, they are nearly given the opportunity to have a romantic, you know, reunion. Except that cops, led by Rene Montoya, come down the alley, Batman takes a hike good allowing uh allowing selena to get arrested again yeah (laughs) you know uh selena ends up getting arrested because she apparently attacked these two people who were simply trying to pick up animals to take to foster homes and shelters and since she's on probation and uh renee and her partner don't really trust her She's taken to jail. She's read her Miranda rights, taken to jail. Who puts up the the bail? None other than Bruce Wayne. But um, you know, he when when he picks her up, she kind of makes it clear that while she appreciates it, I like you a lot, but as a friend. Oh, friend zoned. It happened again, because if we remember, she's been friend zoning him from the very beginning, uh, when he ended up, or when she ended up uh, winning him in a in a uh, an auction, right? And you know, well, remember, uh, his lifestyle doesn't interest her. He's not as exciting, and um, you know, as uh, I don't know, it's it's not exhilarating to be around Bruce Wayne. Mm-hmm. Now, she's been hanging out with Batman. That's a completely different type of, of pairing. It's a different experience to be with him. So I think that in comparison, Bruce Wayne is kind of plain and boring. Yeah. Yeah. She's in love with Batman. Yeah. <laughs> I just said that. It's true. It's true. And you and Bruce totally agree. We always agree. Wow. We are the same. I am Batman. You you pretty much are Batman. But, you know... It, it it begs the question is Bruce now sort of getting to this point of uh I don't want to say stalker fanatic but he clearly is making his own feelings known he is putting them there in front of Selena 
he is bailing her out from jail and uh, she still sort of puts it out there like, look, I'm just not interested. Right. And he seems to understand in that moment, he says, you know, well, as a friend, let me just say that you getting arrested could actually revoke your probation. So uh, it, it's one of those situations where like, look, I want to be here to help you, but you, you got to make sure you don't get into trouble. Well, it's Selena Kyle. She insists that you won't find Selena Kyle snooping around Daggett's, you know, operations. So who do you find snooping around Daggett's operations? Catwoman. Which uh, begs the question again, we all know it's Selena Kyle. All of Gotham knows that Catwoman is Selena Kyle. So why is she putting on the costume again? Well, she performs better in the costume. It's true. That's she, scientific fact. She is more agile in the costume. Well, no, I mean that, uh, well, we actually perform better when we're in the same context or environment um, that we learn those particular skills. So I guess in, in English, I would say if in that costume, that's how she has honed in and practiced and, and really excelled in being... Um, you know, swift and agile and, um, you know, very ninja-like, very cat-like, she's she's going to perform similarly in that costume. Whereas if she's dressed as Selena Kyle, not in the costume, she may not be able to, for, to perform the same way. So if I were her, I would also put that costume on. That goes without saying, doesn't it? I think so. And uh, any opportunity to put on a Catwoman costume, I think people should just take <laughs> So uh, she does, and she goes into Daggett's uh, operations, goes snooping around, finds a, a lab full of animals, and uh, one of those animals happens to be Isis. Isis is, seems to be drugged a little bit. Uh, it's not quite right. She unlocks the gate, picks Isis up, and uh, Isis flips out and bites her on the hand. This isn't good because a couple of scenes earlier, we actually saw what it was that Daggett was doing. The speed at which the toxin overtakes the animal system is something to behold, Mr. Daggett. That's right. Professor Milo is injecting these animals with this serum, this toxin, that is making them, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, it sort of looks like rabies. It, they, they become very feral, very angry, very yeah. you know ready to attack at any given moment, regardless of who you are. Yeah, that's what I understood from that clip, because you know he's my people. He is your people. He speaks he speaks <laughs> lab language, uh, and so that's what's going on. Well, ISIS has clearly been in infected with this uh, serum. And uh, Isis has bitten uh, Catwoman. Well, unfortunately, within minutes, Catwoman is infected. What's happening to me? She becomes feverish, uh, basically unable to stand. She drops to her knees, luckily, just as the Batmobile arrives. Batman comes out, sees her, takes him, or takes her, and uh, insists on going to a hospital. Well, she says that she absolutely can't go to a hospital because obviously that would revoke her probation right. if she shows up wearing this Catwoman costume. So she says she's got to hide out and Batman takes her to the hideout, sort of puts her into bed. And, Wait, uh, where's this hideout? Uh, it's it's next to a frozen lake. And, uh, and you know, he... Uh, he so, just, so some abandoned... Yeah barn kind of looks very feline like it's, oh. it's caddish um so it, it's a sanctuary it, it yeah it, it's it's definitely a hideout of some kind it's not it's not very well camouflaged it's a hideout so batman leaves her there uh but he notices that she is um really quite feverish you're hot now you notice yeah, constantly with the flirty. Took flirty, you long flirty. enough. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, he, he then responds with. I think the fever is making you delusional. Yeah. You know, he's, he's just not, he's not having it. 
No. It's interesting because in costume, Batman is doing the same thing to Selena that Selena does to Bruce out of costume. So he's constantly making himself distant. Mm -hmm. Look, this isn't going to happen. Just letting you know, even though Batman totally wants it. (laughs) Well, and we talked about this in, in the previous episode that she appeared in, in that he's, he has these very separate identities. And as you know, one would think, well, hell here's your chance. Here's, you know, an opportunity to connect with her, perhaps primarily physical, but you know, how, how many opportunities does he have really? So he rejects it, of course, because, you know, anything that might feel good is bad. So he moves away from it. He distances himself and he doesn't make the connection that, well, this could be possibly, maybe not the healthiest thing, but possibly a way for me to express my feelings, a way for me to get some fulfillment in this area of companionship and, and romance. But he ain't having it. Yeah. He ends up going uh, to Roland Daggett's as well. Snoops around, gets one of his thugs, and uh, strings him up. Let's play a little game. And ends up uh, getting information out of the thug. Uh, ends up finding a a anti or a viral anti toxin, uh, and puts two and two together. Viral anti toxins for a plague that doesn't exist yet. But if the plague is introduced via stray dogs and cats. It will blanket Gotham City within weeks. Days, actually. Yeah. So Daggett wants to infect all of Gotham City with this plague. And then he wants to basically sell the antitoxin uh, as, you know, pharmaceuticals. You know, look, we've come in. We've saved the day. We've developed this antitoxin. So it's really quite, quite devious. Uh, The episode is called cat scratch fever which is a real thing right this is some kind of um medical condition it's it's uh, an Mm -hmm. infection right yeah and it often it's basically bacterial and uh, it's transferred uh, often with children but uh it it comes from basically uh cats animals scratching or biting the the victim i read an article that some patients who have been infected with um, what's considered Bartonella, which is, uh, I guess, the bacteria that can um, can lead to cat scratch fever. Uh, some of these patients also exhibit psychological symptoms, which is interesting to me because because we're talking about now we've seen this in animals in this episode that they get um, very I don't know they sound very aggressive, um, very panicked, fearful, kind mm-hmm. of on edge. And of course, um, Selena is attacked and infected and we see the prodromal state where she's, you know, she's starting to get the fever and, you know, the first signs of, um, of this, of this infection. Mm -hmm. Um, but the article I read actually showed that some patients who have cat scratch fever, um, begin to exhibit some, um, psychological symptoms like, um, very quick, uh, agitation, panic attacks, um, some like mood problems, like mood fluctuations. And interestingly, although these are just case studies, these aren't like huge, huge trials, Mm -hmm. um, because not a lot of people, this is a rare thing. Not a lot of people develop this. And it's, it's kind of easily taken care of. Right. So, you know, we don't want to sit there. Hey, you've just been scratched. Let's watch you for a while. See what happens. Right. They really want to get treatment yeah. very, you know, pretty much immediately. Um, but in these, in these cases that have been documented, it, it has shown, it has been shown that the, um, the bacteria can lead to some of these, um, some of these more emotional behavioral symptoms, like being very agitated and panicky and kind of, I don't know, kind of like these cats that you're talking about. No. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So be careful, folks. Yeah. And Selena should get that antitoxin very quickly. Although I get the impression that this is a much more severe case of anything. Uh, it, it might actually be something very dangerous, very deadly, if not treated. Right. Like this is the BTAS version of cat scratch fever. Right. So Batman, of course, gets the antitoxin and escapes from the the lab he's being pursued by 
the the redheaded woman with a machine gun and paunch uh and uh, and a dog uh batman once again ditches a cape uh in order to to get out of there so uh wraps a dog up in a cape so that it can't attack and then he runs away uh, and that man jumps over the barbed wire fence. The dog chases him. The entire thing ends on a um, on a frozen lake, and uh, Batman ends up going through the the ice. Uh, but of course, Batman comes up through the ice, brings the thugs down. It's off to the pound for you. Now, what I find interesting here is they made it very clear that Batman shouldn't be able to survive this level of hyperthermia. Batman then brings these two people who aren't nearly as well equipped to be in this frozen water into the water, right? Mm -hmm. Through the the broken, the ice into the water and, and manages to pull. It's off to the pound for you. He's not really thinking about like, I need to get these people out of the water. Uh, he's got broken ice all around him. There's no real way of getting out just yet. But we ignore all of that. It's just, I'm going to make a quip. And uh, and then we'll figure this out later. He has waited all night to make that quip. So yeah. he's going to take advantage of that. Yeah. He, of course, sends them off to prison. And uh, and Batman then goes and rescues Selina, gives her the antitoxin. And the news comes out uh, with her right there. Once again, she's a hero. So... What do we say with about where these two are in their relationship? Well, she's a she's a hero to Gotham City. I don't think she's a hero yet to Bruce Wayne. I okay. think that he still is categorizing her in this sort of like once a villain, always a villain. Or because she went back into the costume and and went against her probation, or well, for a couple of reasons. One is yes, she inevitably. Um, you know, became the, went back into the Catwoman persona and, uh, and yes, she violated her probation. But the other, I think, bigger issue is that he seems to have this, again, this very categorical, simplistic perspective of her, mm -hmm. that he is not like us in that we have some flexibility in the way that we think and we can understand that there's reason, there's rationale for why she did what she did and she may be on her way to recovery or on her way to a more um, meaningful pro-social lifestyle. Whereas I think that he still holds this, I mean... Talk about holding grudges. This yeah. guy knows how to hold a grudge. Oh, yeah. So once she does something, and she has done several things that that have, you know, rubbed him the wrong way, he, no, nah, you're, now nah, you're, I just. Yeah. He's less willing to, to see her in a different light, one that's more positive, one that could be, um, you know, kind of in the direction of helping her to, toward a more, you know, effective healthy lifestyle and not only that he does show that he's not really holding much of a grudge anymore by the end because who returns isis at the end of the episode batman batman brings isis back drops her off at the window and then we see batman sort of flying away on and on his you know bat line and you know all of that so so Clearly, he's looking out for Selena. Yeah, of course, of course. But you know, again, he has this. I think part of that that piece too about not quite accepting her is that she has rejected the real him. She's really into the Batman, not so much into Bruce. And I think that 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 rejection is is still kind of you know living with him, and he's he's not exactly going to let her off the hook. Yeah. Uh, but as Bruce Wayne says, that's not important, Selena. You are. Oh. So I have to ask because we've been we've been wondering about Bruce's emotional intelligence and his ability to connect with others. There are a couple of people with whom Bruce has proven that he can kind of connect with. He has trouble occasionally with Dick, but he does end up sort of taking him on and, and saying like, you know, you're my, you know, you're basically family to me. I wouldn't want to lose you. 
but he is clearly enamored with Selena. So does this put to rest the idea that Bruce Wayne can't emotionally connect? Well, I think that it's unwise to kind of say like, yes, he has emotional intelligence or no, he doesn't have emotional intelligence. Um, remember that emotional intelligence is um, a feature uh, characteristic that is on a spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. So it's something that, you know, he may in many areas lack that type of intelligence, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't have any emotional intelligence. Okay. Uh, does that make sense? That sure. there's, there's this sort of, it's a dynamic. He's uh, low type on the, trait. he's low on the EQ scale. Oh, you're fancy. I know. Did you look that up? No, I didn't. Are you sure? I know that people with high IQ have a tendency to have low EQ. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That ex that's true. EQ being emotional quotient. That's true. Um, in fact, I was listening to Kevin and Bean, and they were interviewing people who um, had very high IQ. Like they were tested. They received the IQ test and scored, you know, well above one sixty five, one seventy five, which is definitely. Um, definitely considered high IQ. And when they were calling in, they were saying that they were lacking some other, um, other skills socially and emotionally. Right. So one woman explained that she, um, she was great with numbers. She's great with formulas and programs. And, you know, she's very procedural, very organized. But then when it came to birthdays, she had a hard time remembering those mm -hmm. dates. And, and it was because she couldn't really connect with the meaning, mm. um, kind of the interpersonal importance of those dates. Right. And so it would kind of get her into trouble. Uh, that's just one small example. But if you can imagine many of those, um, types of like really, really important, um, things related to relationships and reciprocity and, and, you know, birthdays are actually very important to people. And the idea that someone's so good with numbers and, and formulas actually, couldn't quite grasp the importance of birthdays or couldn't quite, you know, meet the expectations socially around birthdays. And she even said like, I didn't really even know what the big deal was. I had to kind of be reminded about that. And, um, yes, this is all anecdotal, but it did remind me of the conversation we were having around the idea that, you know, just because someone is very intelligent, very well-schooled, um, and, and clearly can, you know, is, is, um, in many ways, uh, a problem solver and who someone we would consider, um, you know, pretty in touch with their intelligence mm -hmm. could actually be uh, pretty low on this emotional intelligence scale. Well, and it, it makes me wonder because I know that there are cases of people who have kind of for lack of a better word, they have invented personas for themselves to help cope with this notion of, um, of what everyone else feels and I should be feeling it too. And so they have a tendency to, to actually develop this character who is socially acceptable, even though that's not really them, that that's just sort of like, this is what will help me get by. So I have the question, is that Bruce Wayne? Like you, you've talked about Bruce, Bruce Wayne, Batman. And Bruce Wayne is the social uh, character who, who you know, everyone knows as the billionaire playboy. Right, he's the public figure. Is that Bruce Wayne compensating for his low emotional quotient? I mean, it could be. It could be that he's recognized what he needs to do in order to develop socially, mm -hmm. or sorry, in order to be successful socially as Bruce Wayne. Right. There are some expectations around what he needs to do, how he needs to behave, Um what relationships he needs to maintain, right? That's really important, right. at, you know, in his role as, as Bruce Wayne, um, you know, head of, of Wayne Industries. But, you know, on the other hand, I'm not saying that Bruce, the authentic person, is lacking in emotional intelligence altogether. Mm -hmm. Remember that I said there are some areas that he's not strong in, and I think that relates to... Um, 
very close relationships, like romantic relationships, like right. um, his role as a caretaker slash parent mm-hmm. slash mentor, that he's, he's not as in touch with those connections and right. with what other people need. Now, when he says that he, um, I would say that he does care about Selena and that those feelings are authentic. I think there are romantic feelings there. And I think he's, he's being honest when he says, you know, you, you really are what's important. But I also think that part of that romance or part of that infatuation or, you know, desire to be close with her has to do with, frankly, with the notion that she actually doesn't want him, Mm -hmm. right? She wants Batman. Mm -hmm. So there's almost the safety around the idea of like, I can really love you. I can really, really care about you. And I'm going to stay safe because you actually don't care about me that way. Mm -hmm. So I can keep you at arm's length. I can express my emotions because I know that we share some kind of closeness, but I'm never going to be hurt by you because you don't like me that way. So he maintains this kind of like, you know, kind of, uh, unrequited Mm -hmm. uh, relationship with her, but he's okay with that because it doesn't put him at risk of being hurt. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, it kind of sounds like he's a little bit of a, of a masochist in a, in a way where he, he doesn't allow himself, I guess he would allow himself the pleasure of being her boyfriend if she was actually interested in him. I guess the other question is, uh, is he more attracted to her because she's not attracted to him? Like, is he one of those guys? And, and I guess we don't know yet. We, we've not no. seen enough. But I think you mentioned that he continues to pursue her, mm-hmm. knowing that she's she's not into it. And I, yeah. I think that, that that is very telling. That there is, again, there is some kind of reward in that. Now, most of us, we, we can't really do that for too long. We, we move on, right? But mm-hmm. he doesn't. Yeah. Well, so the the question still stands, Drea, when it's all said and done. Can this lady leopard really change her spot? Clink. Can she? I mean, can do we are we seeing her transitioning more into potentially a heroine role? Or is this the sort of thing where she's then going to fall back into, you know, criminality at some point? I don't know. I I mean, I I think that what we've gained from this is that they now have, um, they've shared, they, Bruce and, and Selena have, have shared more together now that, Mm -hmm. that they now have this, I guess, richer history that they, they rely on each other more. And hopefully she sees some kind of, um, value in that relationship and she may start to believe him, um, you know, as he, as he wants to guide her or should guide her toward um, a lifestyle that's more healthy. But you're right. I I don't know that we can tell right now. Very cool. Well, it's always a pleasure catching up with Selena Kyle and Catwoman and and Isis. Drea, you've got a really big appearance this this coming weekend. Where are you going to be? So I'm going to be at Long Beach Comic Con this weekend, September 27th, 28th. Um, and I will be on a panel with, um, the folks who write the Harley Quinn comic, Mm. Amanda Connor and Jimmy Palmiotti. Yeah. Yeah. That, that should actually be pretty entertaining. What are you guys going to be talking about? Yeah. So the panel is actually going to be pretty much about the psychology of Harley Quinn and kind of the background and writing behind that. So it's actually the first panel I've been on that, um, really focuses, uh, primarily on Harley Quinn. And, uh, and this is perfect for you because if there's someone who can relate to Harley Quinn, it might be you. Mm. And, uh, you know, if you just took one step closer to the left, you might end up being (laughs) just like her, you and your fascination with the Joker. Yeah. They should, they, they should have a a real, a real treat having you on that. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. It's, it's absolutely, uh, it's an honor. It's a great pleasure to be just up there being able to, to chat about it. So I'm super excited. And, uh, so if you guys are going to be down in Long Beach, please check it out Sunday at 4 p.m. Yeah. Uh, always be sure to check, you know, double check the, the site and everything. Times have a tendency to change occasionally and, uh, y- you know, be, we wouldn't want you to miss it. So uh, Long Beach Comic Con Sunday at four. Yes, sir. 
Very cool. Next week, we have got uh, probably one of my most anticipated episodes of Batman the Animated Series. This is one that stuck with me for a very long time, and I know it's one that you are going to be excited about. We are going to be talking about The Strange Secret of Bruce Wayne. That's right. We are going to be introduced to Hugo Strange. Nice. Uh, Yes. You really can't go wrong with a psychiatrist who seems to get a little under the cowl of Bruce Wayne. Um, But then we also, uh, we meet up with uh, the Penguin, uh, Joker, Two-Face. It's basically a who's who. It's a reunion. It really is. And it's it's one of my all-time favorites uh, with a story by our good friend David Wise. So, Excellent. Yeah. It, as always, uh, you guys can find us on Twitter. We are at Arkham Sessions. Drea, where can they find you? I am at Arkham Asylum Doc. And of course, the website uh, where you can find all the posts, all of the podcasts, and my contact info is under the mask online.com. And I am at bward028 on Twitter. Uh, as always, it has been an absolute pleasure, Drea. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, until next week, guys, I'm Brian Ward. I'm Dr. Andrea Letamendi. And we are the Arkham Sessions.